Chapter 6 The Closet Chris rattled through the gates of Sona Dolce towards the Smileys to retrieve Emily. Parked at the front of their driveway, he opened his door, swung around, and dropped both feet down. In that moment, a soaking wet Snickers bolted from the house and trumpeted Chris's arrival with barks and sniffs. Then came the shake that irrigated everything within a ten-foot radius. The dog retreated as Patricia and Emily bounded outside in swimsuits. Hi, Patty, said Chris. How's the water? She giggled and bashfully nodded. Emily laughed and grabbed her father's arm so he could inspect her hand. Daddy, look! It's wrinkled! You stayed in the water too long. Uh-huh. Mrs. Smiley said the same thing. It'll return to normal in a few minutes. Collect your belongings so we can go home. Patricia whispered something in Emily's ear and then looked up at Chris with a beaming grin. Dad? What? Patty asked if we can spend the night. They want to take me bowling. Oh, I don't know about that, Em. We don't want to wear out your welcome. Mrs. Smiley needs a break. Jennifer approached from the entryway. It's fine with me, Chris. I don't mind. Those two have become inseparable, and, well, you know, she's like her second daughter. You leave me no argument, Chris smiled. I suppose there's no valid reason to keep her away then, but not overnight. We have some chores to do in the morning. Chris searched around in one of his front pockets, found a couple of twenties, and gave them to Emily. Don't spend it all. She frowned at the notion. Patricia dragged her inside, incessantly giggling at their evening's prospects. What do we say, Patty? Jennifer demanded. Thank you. Thank you what? Thank you, Mr. Miller. Chris laughed while he restarted the rabbit. You're welcome, girls. He thanked Jennifer and sped home. He climbed to the top of the driveway and parked on the garage's right side, closest to the mudroom's door. The diesel spiraled into a slow, coughing death. Chris breezed into the house and made for the kitchen, plopped his attache on the counter, nabbed a fresh glass from the dishwasher, and then reached into the refrigerator for a filtered pitcher of water. He poured a full glass and held it to his perspirative forehead for a few moments before quaffing it down. He stepped upstairs to the master bedroom, placed the case on the bed, stripped off his clothes, and jumped in the shower. The day's events percolated as he gazed into oblivion, letting the hot water steam the air while beating down his tense back. Twenty or so minutes went by in a blink. Enough, he thought. Shutting off the water, its last trickles audibly ran down the drain as he opened the shower door. He grabbed a towel, dried off, wrapped himself, returned to the bedroom, and sat at the edge of the bed next to his attaché. He stared at a particular section of Suzanne's clothes beyond in the closet, still hanging untouched for two years. Pausing at each moment, he remembered the last time his wife wore each garment. Wool jacket, Tahoe skiing. White blouse. Dinner with Jack at the club. He arrived at a short black skirt, remembering a good time with friends at a local restaurant. He recalled the cab ride home because they were energetically buzzed and that Emily was attending a slumber party that night. He remembered the vision of his ravishing wife and the hours of passion that followed. Chris lost himself in their best lovemaking. It had been a while, he thought. Probably long enough. He began to think that he might be torturing himself unnecessarily. Still, the sensations of that night lingered. He knew they would forever. Unconsciously maintaining the trance, Chris turned around and felt the attaché resting against his thigh. He wondered if he should dare experiment with his own life, a laconic mental exercise if there ever was one. He retrieved the laptop, flipped it open, and held the power button down, allowing the boot sequence to begin. Less than a minute later, the native Linux interface featuring the Amerimim logo splashed onto the screen. Chris navigated to his application and executed it. After the program opened, he toggled the filter tray's eject function. The fragile tray quietly slid open from the side of the laptop, exposing its collection membrane to the open air. Almost immediately, the program recognized dozens of trap fragments and began parsing their contents. Chris quickly slid the tray closed before too many were collected, thinking the application would crash if he didn't. Seconds ticked. The algorithm concluded its assessment of the fragment contents, revealing two as containing intelligible media. 
He clicked on the first fragment's file and ran it. A window appeared only to play a series of bright white flashes and a blip of audio that sounded like barking. He presumed the barking was likely Snickers, since he was the only dog in recent contact that could have transferred any fibrous matter. The player initiated with the characteristic bright white flashes until a new scene appeared from within the static. From Suzanne's point of view, she embraced Chris in a hug before backing off to admire her new jacket. It was the same wool jacket, still hanging in their closet. I love it, my Hudson, she declared with an embrace as the image dissolved into a series of white flashes. The laptop screen began to shake from Chris's trembling. He was in shock, mesmerized by an overload of emotion and possibility. He considered his new connection to Suzanne, and a strong thirst for her essence suddenly overtook him. His scientific side briefly interceded the new romantic fantasy, but only briefly. Chris's comprehension of his little discovery blossomed. Petitio principi, indeed. Albert, you are a brilliant man. Chris excitedly hopped off the bed and snatched a comb from the bedroom. He took it to the master closet and waited several moments to let the air settle. Carefully, he clicked on the tray eject icon, releasing the filter tray from the laptop's side. Smoothly, he raked a sleeve of Suzanne's jacket just above the filter tray. In seconds, new fragments began registering. First a few, then hundreds. Chris closed the tray and went back to the bed to sit down. 915 fragments registered, eventually acknowledging only five with any presentable content. Chris feverishly clicked on their icons to view the contents. The first started with the flashing and then played a hazy scene from Suzanne's point of view. She walked towards her car, twisting her ankle on the last step in the garage, screaming in pain just before the image faded. The second fragment showed her chatting with Jennifer Smiley about a Christmas play that both Emily and Patricia would be attending. Huh? Chris said under his breath. I don't remember that conversation. The third fragment brought tears as it displayed the heat of a senseless argument he had with Suzanne. Chris stopped and felt like he wasn't doing himself any favors dredging up history, new or otherwise. Intoxicating curiosity may get the better of him. Is this toxic? Fragment four displayed a much longer scene. This time, from his viewpoint, Suzanne was frantically stripping off her clothes in the heat of another high-intensity moment. Chris never thought he would see her naked again much less in this fashion, yet there she was. Her striking beauty paralyzed him. It was reason number one of many reasons he fell in love. Just as quickly as she appeared, she faded within the static haze and silent bright white flashes. Chris touched the screen. More tears welled in mournful acquiescence. He decided not to open any more of the fragment files. It was too much to bear, and he was harming himself, answering his own question. He knew that much, and he knew it was time to let her go, to free himself. Now that he had seen her alive again, and with new experiences, he realized the addictive danger. Where would it end? Would he forever search for more fragments, any fragments, even those from her childhood home? His heart wept with renewed grief from her loss, and he couldn't bring himself to move from the edge of the bed. Several moments passed while Chris's mind thawed. The laptop, still waiting to execute Fragment 5, lapsed into hibernation mode. Chris would not reboot. Instead, he powered down, tucking the computer into his midsection and whimpering himself to sleep. Just before consciousness escaped him, the doorbell rang. Chris forced himself up and threw on his robe before heading downstairs to the front door. Jennifer was dropping Emily off from their bowling trip. Jeez, Chris, you look terrible. Everything okay? Rubbing his eyes and still sniffling, Chris answered, Yeah, I'm fine. Come on inside, Em. Good night, Emily. We had fun tonight. Good night, Mrs. Smiley. Jen, wait. Chris stopped himself from closing the door. What did she score? Jennifer batted a lash. 185 and a 203? Rails up, of course. Ah, right. Not bad, though. Okay, thanks. See you guys Monday, if not before. Have a fabulous night, you two. Thanks, Jen. Already bored in the throes of the evening's anticlimax, Emily went straight to her room and immediately jumped on the monkey phone with Patricia. Chris went back to his bedroom, dropped the robe, 
and climbed in between his golden Egyptian cotton sheets, falling directly into a deep, dreamless sleep. Emily awakened the following day to the sounds of a local radio station jockeying one of her favorites, this particular week anyway, by Four Frisco. Her father was also in the room, fiddling with Zeno while holding the computer laptop. Startled by the unannounced intrusion, she immediately sat up, furled both brows, and yanked the earbuds out of her ears. What are you doing? she yelled. Oh, just a little experiment with your friend here. Did I wake you? You scared me. Sorry, honey, I'll be out of here in just a minute. Chris toggled the filter tray, and, as it slid open, he combed one of Zeno's arms, attempting to collect fibrous matter. After the fragment register passed 500, he closed the tray. While the laptop processed, he looked back at Emily, winked, and exited. Go back to sleep if you want, Em. It's still early. He shut her door and returned to the master bedroom. With three pillows at his back, he reached for his cup of coffee while the laptop completed its filtration. Only two fragment files appeared, much to his disappointment. He clicked on the first one, producing the familiar bright white flashes. Within the static, an image of a carnival slowly materialized through Emily's perspective. She was holding Zeno just after Suzanne won him at the balloon race, and they were walking to the bumper cars. Voices were crystal clear on this fragment. Come this way, sweetie. We'll bash your daddy at the electric cars. Yes, Emily hissed. The fragment fizzled. Chris's eyes immediately flooded, crying and laughing. He decided to click on the other fragment, hoping for more of the same scene. Emily straggled into the room at the same time, scratching her eyes as she wondered at the computer's flashing screen. Daddy, I'm hung. She abruptly froze. Urine ran down one leg, and she began shaking uncontrollably, eyes locked onto the laptop's screen. Chris turned around to look at it. Zeno. His eyes were glowing yellow, and his oversized incisors protruded from an exaggerated red grin. He was coming at Emily from the doorway he just demolished, going for her legs, then his face filled the entire screen. As the fragment faded into the flashes, his voice started to fade, sounding like someone who had choked on 50 years of cigarettes and broken mirrors. It appeared as if he were looking at Emily at that exact moment. I told you, you can't hide from me, he gurgled. She screamed and collapsed directly on the puddled floor, sobbing. Chris shut the laptop and ran to her side. What the hell was that? What was that, Emily? Emily had difficulty controlling her shock. Chris tried to calm her by holding her tightly. This is Zeno, Daddy. No, sweetheart. Zeno is a doll. Who is that? I'm telling you, it's him. It's Zeno. I thought I was asleep when he came. You said it was just a bad dream. It is, sweetie. It is a dream. And now it's over. Let's go get you cleaned up and get some breakfast. It took several moments for Emily to calm down. She nodded and sniffled as the tears soaked her face. Chris cradled his daughter into the bathroom and ran the shower. Go ahead, it's okay. Leave your clothes on the floor. I'll take care of them later. Emily paused by the shower as Chris walked back into the bedroom. No, Daddy, don't go. It's okay, Em. I'll be right outside. Hurry up and we'll go to Benny's. The apparition perplexed him. That wasn't real, was it? Chris reasoned that it must have coincided with Emily's nightmare from a couple weeks ago. Uh, dreams too? Really? He began to understand that the soft drive reads fragments generated from the actual thoughts of people. Not solely what their senses recorded, but their cognitive interpretations as well. The thought occurred to him concerning manipulative applications. It was an ugly thought. Emily dripped out of the shower and toweled off. She wrapped herself and exited the bathroom to where her father was finished cleaning the floor. Chris brought her back into his arms, damp towel and all. Emily, I need to ask you about what was on the screen. In the relative safety of her father's arms, Emily managed to consider it for a second. With her eyes staring blankly towards the distance, she painfully recalled the episode. What you saw a minute ago? That was him? You sure? Uh-huh. Chris held her tight as she welled up with tears again, burying her face in his chest. It's all right. He can't hurt you, honey, because he's simply a doll in a dream. Nothing more.
Emily continued to cry. Chris knew it was one of those moments he wished Suzanne were still around. She was the emotional healer of the family, and she always selected the best words. Emily slowly wound down. Chris carried her back to her room and placed her on the bed. Get dressed, little trooper. We'll go eat now. Emily's eyes widened as Chris turned his back to leave. He spun back around to see Emily pointing at Zeno sitting atop the chest of drawers next to her door. Chris laughed and took the doll with him to his bedroom. There, he placed Zeno on top of the back shelf next to the large walk-in closet. He pondered all the history that could be floating around in that confined space, locked within the fragments. A minute later, the closet's lint got the better of him. Achoo! Well, that kind of says everything, doesn't it? He thought. Emily reappeared in the hallway several minutes later. No music player or skimpy top. Change of heart? I'm not in the mood. Chris laughed as they walked downstairs. The hum of the garage door slowly opened to the blazing valley sunshine. They climbed inside the car and fastened their seat belts. Chris fired the diesel, backed carefully down the driveway. As the garage door closed, he slid onto Kalina Alta Court and gurgled away from Sono Dolce.